Good afternoon. My name is Eileen Doherty Sill. I'm the Associate Director of the Political Science Undergraduate Program here at Penn. Welcome to today's Knowledge by the Slice Lunchtime Talk. The Knowledge by the Slice series is sponsored by Penn Arts and Sciences to give the community a chance to hear from some of the school's outstanding faculty members. Today we've put together a group of political science faculty to talk about the State of the Union entering President Trump's second year. I'm going to introduce our panelists in alphabetical order, and then they're going to talk going straight down the line, so in a little bit of a different order than I'm introducing them. Um, first, we have Ryan Brucker, uh, who focuses on issues crossing international political economy, international law, and international security, examining the domestic politics of international negotiations and cooperation. Guy Grossman, at the end of the table, examines the political economy of development with a regional focus on sub-Saharan Africa and Israel-Palestine. Matt Lewandowski, right here, looks at political behavior of ordinary citizens by studying political polarization, voter cue-taking, and the impact of partisan media. Dawn Teal researches women in politics. She focuses on voting rights reform, candidate recruitment and election, incumbency and gender, and democratization and economic development. And finally, Alex Weisiger studies internal, I'm sorry, international politics particularly political decisions relating to the use of force, including regional systems of war, the democratic peace, and the role of reputation in international politics. So each of the panelists will speak for about five minutes. That should leave plenty of time for questions and answer. Enjoy the pizza, and we will start with Professor Lewandowski. Thanks. Uh. <laughs> it, I, have, I have a script that says, lead the applause, and someone else wrote the script for me, so here we go. So. Uh, so thanks. I'll talk some about uh, some of the domestic political um, situations. And so as I thought about what's changed and, and what hasn't, in some ways, you know, the maybe remarkable thing is uh, how much has sort of stayed the same. Uh, so if you think about what politics was like under the Obama administration, in many ways, certain aspects of politics at least look very much the same. So in both, under both administrations, we had high levels of congressional polarization, a large degree of gridlock, little appetite for actually legislating. Um, almost all of the policy change uh, has come from executive orders and agency rulemaking, um, which, as we've seen, are less durable than uh, many other types of lawmaking for a whole variety of reasons. Although how many of the, the sort of rollbacks of that that we've seen through the Trump administration will last, I don't know, because nearly all of them are being challenged in the courts. Uh, so we've seen that the party out of power continues to make political hay out of the debt ceiling, which is a purely political crisis if ever there was one. Um, and even seemingly apolitical issues become wrapped up in politics. Think about, for example, the NFL. Um, and so even perhaps Trump's, one of Trump's most noteworthy features or most remarkable features, right, his, his love to invoke the phrase uh, fake news, um, in some ways is more difference of degree rather than difference of kind, right? So that's actually an old strategy um, going back uh, many decades with Republicans. Um, think about people like Buckley or Al Brent Bozel. Um, and remember during the primary debates in 2016 where uh, Marco Rubio said that Hillary Clinton's largest super PAC was the mainstream media, right? So Trump takes that to new levels, but he's actually not that different in that respect from other Republicans. There are a few ways in which I think he is more, uh, more sui generis, so to speak. Uh, so the first is I think he sort of shifted norms about the way in which you politicize the process. Uh, so, you know, think about his alleged attempts to fire Mueller, he's never actually admitted that, um, the attacks on the FBI, the you know, Muslim ban, right? So, I mean, it's interesting that some of those things have been blocked by courts, um, and some of them have been blocked by people within the Trump administration. The largely missing actor has been Congress. That's who usually pushes back. We'll see if that changes, but probably not, unless Democrats take control in 2018. Uh, and then I think the other ways in which he, he's different are I've never met, seen anyone in any kind of politics who's so good at distraction. Um, so I'll give you two examples. One, Stormy Daniels. That just came and went, right? Like we paid 130, well, uh, now Trump's lawyer is saying that he paid $130,000, but someone paid $130,000 to an adult film star, um, you know, allegedly covering up an affair and that it barely even made a blip. <laughs> Um, second, if you saw this morning, the New York Times story suggests that the whole um, 
uh, story that came out yesterday that we were going to replace SNAP with Blue Apron, for, but for poor people. Um, the administration admitted this morning that was just it's just a distraction. They're trying to distract you from the fact that they're trying to make $30 billion of cuts to supplemental nutrition assistance. Um, so he he is the he is not the he's not the art of the deal. It's the art of distraction, right? That he always is keeping the news turning in a way that makes it hard for any story to actually stick. Um, and related to that is, you know, this is someone who has very little impulse control. I actually am sort of fascinated that he hasn't um, tweeted out more things uh, lately because, you know, I think in some ways he's his own worst enemy. He, we've just seen again and again, this is not someone who has the ability to restrain himself. And that also comes out that he, this is not someone who has the ability to legislate. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, you know, something of a, of a mixed bag, in some ways a continuation of, of trends we've seen before, but maybe some other things that are perhaps a bit more troubling in the long term. Don? Okay, wow, thanks, thanks Matt. Um, so there was a moment in, I think it was the second debate, when, you know, this, this issue of Trump's discussion of, of women um, gets described as locker room talk. And I think that this is probably the most important moment for feminism that I've ever really experienced in my lifetime, for sure, but also that um, I think we could have asked for. It was brilliant. It was infuriating. It sort of laid bare this implicit, uh, this implicit conversational style that we all know happens all the time. Um, but it gives us also a target to shoot at, right? Before this election, a lot of people could think to themselves, you know, there's, we, we're making progress on racial issues. We're making progress on gender issues. In fact, you know, the glass ceiling, it's about to be shattered or it's really rather thin. And what this moment, this sort of, well, this is all just locker room talk, just, you know, brings to the fore is the fact that it's actually just as bad as our grandmothers have told us. Um, so obviously the Women's March was a really big moment that happened uh, the day after Trump's election all over the country. It's the single largest protest that's ever happened in American history. Uh, and if you also note, many other countries followed suit with Women's Marches in many of the urban centers around the world. But the question that remains after the Women's March is, what is the policy agenda for the new feminist moment? And it's a question that we don't yet have an answer to. Uh, in part because I think that there are um, many divisions among women who consider themselves to be feminists that we have uh, yet to fully understand. So I guess I want to talk about two things. One is, first of all, what Trump has been able to accomplish that is harmful for women um, and you know LGBTQI people. And the second is, you know what this mo what we can do in this moment to think about an actual policy agenda for feminism moving forward. So on the one hand, we know that he's had a dismal record in terms of actual legislative um, changes. He's not really able to get the Congress on his side and pass any initiatives, despite all the bluster about the wall, et cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, we know that in issues related to federal programs, um, especially related to health and human services, there are these huge bureau bureaucracies, bureaucratic appointments, and you can actually have a lot of power in who you appoint to these offices. So we have the situation in the Health and Human Services Department where we now have a new <laughs> division of conscious and religious freedom that is you know, taking on the important task of trying to protect people's religious freedom, but ultimately it's a division that is um, put in place in order to roll back protections for women and um, transgender people basically to have access to the basic health care that they need. So some of the expansions in um, the rights of transgender students, for example, or transgender patients to get access to um, essential medical treatment have been rolled back. This is particularly a worry in more rural areas where there aren't access to um, as many sort of medical institutions as we might have here in Philadelphia. Um, so that is one area where I think you know you have to you have to sort of shine your light when you're thinking about what impact you can have on um, on public policy more generally, um, and then of course we have this issue of Me Too. 
So, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, but there's this really fat, or the it's like a little clip, but there's this really fabulous little song floating around the internet, which is taking Trump's own words regarding uh, women's bodies and actually just putting it to a song. And the basic punchline is, and this is Trump's own words, when you're a star, you can do anything, right? And this has been a kind of very profound thing for many women around the country who are stepping forward. Obviously, many really prominent women who are stepping forward and saying the sexual harassment has happened to me. Long-term molestation has happened to so many, you know, gymnasts and professional athletes and things like that. And there are so many people who are complicit who didn't know, you know, who said they didn't know anything about this but have been informed many, many times. So this idea that time's up is, is really important. Um, but the question is, so that is something that was sort of unexpected going into this and definitely prompted by the you know, locker room talk type discussion. But what is the policy agenda besides just sort of outing the bad apples? And I think that we can get caught up in some of these um, more sort of solidaristic moments without necessarily thinking through what the policies that we should care about for feminism in this century are. So I just want to say to Great. Single mothers are the most likely to be in poverty of anybody in the country. Uh, the new budget uh, has, you know, giant military expansions, but rolls back um, Medicaid. Um, this is an abomination. This should be on the, you know, this should be primary for feminists. Um, we have, you know, incredibly low wages in the service sector. Many people who work in restaurants and things like that don't even get paid the minimum wage. The majority of workers in the service sector are women and women of color. Um, there's no tax or unemployment insurance for the majority of domestic and care workers in this country. That should be a priority for feminism. Um, and finally, the sort of decentralized nature of things like aid to dependent children um, is a huge problem for people who are struggling, families who are struggling, who are, who are below the poverty line. So I think that the main thing that we should be focused on in this new moment for feminism is not just you know, outing the bad apples, but also thinking about who are the most marginalized and what are the policy agendas that we can kind of coalesce around. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to shift gears from domestic policy to sort of the state of the union, particularly with regard to economic affairs in our international relations. And the thesis I want to put forward is that under the current administration, what has essentially been happening is a showing of opposition and withdrawal from multilateral agreements, and also a showing of sort of disdain toward international law and the enforcement of it. And I'm going to highlight this through the areas of trade, because that's a part of the uh, policy realm that Trump has been focusing a lot on, also happens to be what I study a lot of. So, the first thing, one of the first actions that Trump was able to take with regards to international relations was withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP, one of the largest trade deals that had been put together um, ever, actually, and something that the previous administration had worked hard on. It was a partnership that was going to have 11 of our largest trading partners involved and was set up to help harmonize the rules across all these countries. And in an interesting way, was actually trying to create a more level playing field and more reciprocity between those countries, something that Trump has gone back and said, if only we had an agreement that would do that, then I would be more likely to support it. Um, and it's been very interesting the last month, his rhetoric has changed of saying, well, maybe we should consider joining the TP if it had more things favorable to us. Well, it turned out, it had a lot more provisions that were favorable to the U.S. that we had negotiated and pushed really hard for that were then dropped as soon as we pulled out of it. And the other countries said, well, if we don't have to deal with the U.S., we can get rid of these practices or these rules that the U.S. proposed. And so the other countries are moving forward without us. And I think that's a trend. Is countries moving forward without the U.S. means that we are potentially getting left behind in some of these areas. And there's going to be significant consequences for U.S. workers, for the U.S. economy as a whole, Etc. A second point where we've seen this is, of course, with the administration's position on NAFTA. It was a statement that was made repeatedly that we either need to renegotiate or withdraw from NAFTA. That was made during the campaign, and it's something that's continued um, now through six rounds of renegotiation talks on NAFTA. And interestingly, what the U.S. has been advocating for um, 
is, is kind of surprising in some ways. One of the components is this disdain for sort of the enforcement of international law. And the Trump administration recently proposed that when we renegotiate NAFTA, it should have a dispute settlement provision. You could think of this as the enforcement provision of when countries have a disagreement, how do they uh, resolve it? And he says it should be an opt-in provision. And you can essentially think of this as if you're in high school and your teacher tells you you've done something wrong, and you say, well, I'd like to opt out of any potential repercussions. And the US essentially said, we will probably be opting out of this, but we think Canada and Mexico should be opting in. Clearly, there's a problem with that if you want actually fair and reciprocal agreements. And Canada's response was, well, that's fine. If you want to opt out, we'll have an agreement that's bilateral, something the Trump administration has talked a lot about, but not with you. We'll have a dispute settlement agreement with Mexico directly, and once again, the US would be left behind. Interestingly, I want to highlight on this, if you look at NAFTA dispute settlement, two-thirds of the cases that the US are involved in, we initiate to protect our firm's rights in other countries, which is why the US Association of Manufacturers strongly supports having a even stronger dispute settlement mechanism, both in international trade but agreements and NAFTA specifically, in a, as opposed to we're only on the receiving side of being challenged about a third of the time. So in general, these types of agreements, at least throughout the history so far, have been used more by the US to enforce our rights with other countries. And so I think the bias that has been perceived by the administration is somewhat the opposite of what the historical record has shown us. A second part of the disdain for international law or, or opposition to it has come up in the World Trade Organization, where the Trump administration has decided to block the appointment of appellate body members. Now, the Trump administration has made uh, no secret of their view that the WTO has not been a good deal for the US. But as I already mentioned about the position of the manufacturers in the US and many of our major businesses, what they have liked a lot is that when other countries aren't following the agreements, we can file a complaint and essentially bring them to court at the WTO. What the Trump administration has done is said, we're blocking the appointment of the appellate body members. You can think of that as being like the Supreme Court for international trade. And in fact, we're down to having only four members at the WTO on that body. It needs three members to hear every single panel. And so what the problem is, is that normally there's seven of them so they can share the duty. And instead, it's starting to slow down. And we have two more retiring in the next year. And the problem is, is that potentially we bog down the World Trade Organization system so that we can't resolve our disputes through these legal processes. And instead, countries have to start turning to unilateral action, which is where you worry about undermining the international uh, regime and the system itself, and potentially having the trade wars that have been discussed at great length. So thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm going to follow Professor Brucker in talking about foreign policy. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of the current issues in North Korea or Syria or so forth, but I want to sort of focus my comments on broader implications of the Trump administration. So as others have noted, uh, Trump promised a lot on the campaign trail. He's not unique among people running for office, but he promised a major break in foreign policy. He talked about undoing bad deals, uh, stopping other countries from, making, from taking advantage of the US. That was both adversaries and allies, and NATO members who aren't paying their fair share. Uh, and he promised to clamp down on immigration. Uh, but when it comes to what he's actually done since coming into office, there's been a lot, as Professor Lewandowski noted, of continuity with where things were before. A lot of things that he promised to do he hasn't done. And the, he hasn't ripped up the Iran deal. He hasn't actually reinstated waterboarding, which is generally recognized as torture. He hasn't ripped up NAFTA or done anything really substantial there. He hasn't declared China a currency manipulator. He hasn't weakened the US commitment to NATO. Uh, he hasn't dramatically changed relations with Russia. He, basically engaged in war with the Islamic State along the same lines the Obama administration was doing. So there's, there's a lot of continuity there. Uh, and some of the things where there are changes, there are things that any Republican uh, politician would have done. Uh, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, this was an agreement that uh, you know, the US signed only once it made sure under the Obama administration that there wouldn't be anything binding about it. Uh, and any Republican who got elected would have pulled the U.S. out anyway. Uh, the TPP 
um, you know, we can talk about its merits or, you know, downside, uh, but Clinton came out in opposition to it. It was going to take a lot to actually get that through. So even if you think this was something that would have been in the U.S.'s interest, the political alignment was not really there. The things that he has done, uh, immigration, which having peeked over to my right, Professor Grossman will talk at least a little about. So that that is something that's more uniquely to him. And he likes to do certain symbolic kinds of things, like moving the, the uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem or things like that, uh, that can have some implications. But he hasn't done bigger uh, foreign policy shifts. So from that perspective, there is a fair amount of continuity. There are certainly concerns about the lack of expertise uh, and what's going to happen when things get more difficult. But you know, you don't have major changes there. That said, the language with which he talks about foreign policy is really different. And this could have some important long-term consequences. And here I want to talk in particular about what has been called sort of the American world order, the liberal world order, kind of a way, a, a system of governance in the international uh, in international relations that was established after World War II, led by the United States. And basically coming out of World War II, facing a threat from the Soviet Union, American leaders looked out and said, we want to build a world, you know, a, a world system that will be predicated on economic openness, on democracy, on respect for certain norms around human rights, around territorial integrity. That, that order has been incredibly successful. You have far more democracy in the world today. You have much more economic prosperity. Uh, you've limited the amount of, of conflict between countries compared to what you saw before. Uh, but that has been predicated on an active American role in maintaining that. And some of the things that Trump points to, that the US pays a disproportionate amount into international organizations, doesn't always get as much out of it. That the US pays more, in, you know, spends more on defense spending than its NATO allies do. That has been a persistent uh, sort of um, tension with American relations with other countries. That this order has been dependent on the US being willing to pay significant costs to, to uphold it. And, as you take away serious threats from countries like the Soviet Union, American public willingness to continue to pay these kinds of costs has, has declined over time. So a lot of what Trump is doing now in terms of challenging things is really in many ways challenging that order. And one of the big questions long term is as you hollow out the State Department, as you, uh, as you undermine norm, uh, norms of human rights and expectations of democracy, is this going to really weaken that order that has had these benefits internationally but has also faced some significant challenges recently? Would somebody else step up? There, the Chinese have kind of responded to uh, Trump's uh, uh, statements by saying, well, we'll play the role the U.S. has, but it's not really clear that they can, and it's also not really clear that they'd really be willing to pay the costs that are associated with, with underpinning this. They, they, it's great to say this, and, and you can look good in the international system. Uh, it's not clear that they'd really be willing to step in. And if that order were ultimately to collapse, that could have really serious consequences for freedom internationally, for economic openness and prosperity, and potentially for interstate conflict. That I'll turn it over to Professor Preston. Okay, so I'm a student of uh, developing countries, and, and uh, for many developing countries, uh, as, as the fellow panelists said, there's more continuity uh, than change in the administration. Uh, I think it's very telling, partly because of the focus on uh, domestic issues in the first year of the administration. I think it's quite telling that the first 45 minutes of the State of the Union last uh, Tuesday were devoted, uh, you know, uh, they were devoted. Uh, only to, uh, uh, to domestic issues. And when, when President Trump started talking about issues that are related also to foreign policy, things like uh, uh, ISIS and uh, sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela and North Korea are also uh, um, are not really issues that are of much uh, uh, interest to uh, the vast majority of, uh, of developing uh, countries. Having said that, there's three issues that I do want to touch uh, that, um, that are important and might signal some, uh, some, some change, uh, at least going into the next year uh, or so. The first, the first one is the aid regime. That is obviously ex extremely important to low-income countries and, and to African countries in particular. And I'm going to quote from uh, um, uh, a sentence that uh, Trump said in, in, in last week's uh, uh, State of the Union. So he says, tonight I'm asking the Congress to pass legislation to help ensure American foreign assistance dollars uh, 
always serve American interests and only go to American friends. As we strengthen uh, friendships around the world, we are also restoring clarity about our uh, adversaries. So, uh, so th that's, that sentence and that, uh, um, uh, th that caught a lot of attention uh, uh, in, in, in many developing countries. Uh, it's, it's true that there's, there's a part of a continu continuity here in the sense that uh, it's always been the case that aid, aid has been used by U.S. Uh, to buy uh, support. Um, you know, we can talk about it as a soft power. What is different in this administration, and this goes back to some of my, what a colleague said about like, the, the rhetoric, the rhetoric is actually quite important because when you put it out so blatantly that aid will be tied to uh, support in international bodies, uh, you really box uh, uh, some of your, your, your friends and potential friends in, in, in an uncomfortable situation. So, so they are in a kind of a lose-lose situation, in the lose in the sense of like if they don't support uh, the administration in international bodies, uh, they, they, they face the wrath of this administration. If they do support, you know, say vote with the, with the, the United States in, in, in UN resolution, uh, they open themselves to critique at home of being, you know, puppets of the West, you know, this is all neo-colonialism, this is, so, you know, the kind of the, the, the damned if they will and the damned if they're not, and so this idea of like boxing uh, uh, leaders uh, into a, a very uncomfortable uh, situation is, is, uh, um, is something that will be interesting to see how this unfolds in the coming year, and obviously the fact that the United States is less willing to support uh, countries that are not fully um, on board with the, with the administration uh, means that there's no vacuum. And into this vacuum that is uh, opening, especially in Africa, there's two, there's two uh, countries that are entering. One is China and one, in, one is Russia. And so China is making huge investments ac across Africa. Uh, and, and how this will start unfolding uh, in the coming years will be, uh, will be interesting. The second point where there is a clear interest to developing countries, and again, I, as a student of Africa, I can speak mostly for that, uh, is, is the, the rhetoric of the administration and the policies of the administration with respect to immigration. Okay? And so, uh, obviously, uh, the comments that President Trump made recently, the shit old nations and that Nigerians should go back to their huts, you know, obviously did not resonate that well across Africa, as you can uh, as you can uh, uh, imagine, but it's not only at the level of uh, it's not only at the level of, of rhetoric. Uh, uh, countries at the south view immigration um, as something that is essential uh, is, is something that they, they, they is, is is essential to like planning, also to revenue. I mean, uh, something like 20, 30 percent of of revenue in many uh, low-income countries are coming from remittances from uh, from overseas, so uh, we talk about like at the, at the magnitude of 20, 30 percent of, of 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 GDP. This is huge. Okay, so for them, they are they are paying attention, and the fear is that the, the type of rhetoric of blocking people out, you know, uh, strengthens anti-immigrant uh, forces also in Europe and can create a lot of tensions going uh, forward. So this is another area that we should be looking uh, looking uh, into. The last thing that I want to mention, uh, uh, that uh, uh, here there's a clear break. Uh, in, so well, whereas immigration and aid worries African uh, leaders, uh, there's one issue that uh, they're, they're happy with uh, President Trump, and that, is, uh, and, that, and that is the fact that President Trump um, does not uh, feel the need to uh, speak uh, in support of democratic values and human rights uh, when he uh, addresses uh, the international uh, community. He doesn't think that that should be a matrix for evaluating who's a friend and who's a foe. Uh, and to the extent that the administration uh, is happy with, uh, uh, with a relationship that are unconditional on the human rights a violation on democratic on, on, on upholding democratic norms that resonates quite well across the the, the, the developing uh, world. I will just I know, I know I'm running out of time. I'll just I'll just I'll, the fi the last thing I, I will say is that the way at least developing countries are approaching uh, Trump 
is, is, is on very practical terms. So it's all about trying to, uh, to, uh, to not steer too much of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, contention. Even after the shithole uh, uh, comments, the African Union drafted a very like, strong condemnation. They decided to, to, uh, uh, to not publish it and not ask for an apology. And, and the argument that they were making is, the American people elected uh, Trump. We will deal with that. Okay, so that was kind of that's, that was like a Kagame's uh, position. So going forward, what I expect to see is some accommodation on one hand, but also check out and, and, and look at what's going on, especially with the aid regime and and and, and uh, China and Russia's entry to some of these areas. Thank you. So now it's time for question and answer. I think there are microphones going up and down both sides. Here we have one and microphone on the other side. So we'll just take turns going back and forth. <coughs> so, sir. With the increase in American isolationism and the ascendancy of China economically, do you perceive that the uh, status of the dollar as a reserve currency is imperiled, and if so, what would the cost of that be? All right. <laughs> Pretty clear who's going to start with that one. Uh, I actually do not see that it, the status of the dollar as the primary reserve currency is in peril at this time. I think it is so institutionalized in across international commerce, banking, et cetera, that I actually think this is a point of continuity as, as a number of my colleagues have pointed to in this administration. And I think that there's still a great deal of faith in the Federal Reserve Board and other institutions in the U.S. that there's more continuity than not, and that'll keep the currency going as, a, as the primary reserve currency on the international scene. And the thing that, I, this is not my area of expertise, but the thing that I have heard people say along these lines is that there, it's, the Chinese currency is not in a position to occupy that role at this point, and that's something that would require some significant changes uh, before you could talk about China having a, a reserve currency. Hi. Um, both in practice, but particularly in rhetoric, Trump seems to have smashed a lot of our norms, and I'm curious how you think that will impact the standards that we as a society hold our future leaders to. Uh, okay. So, yeah, you know, it, I go back and forth a lot um, on this about what I think the long-term implications will be. Um, so, I mean, I think some of his worst excesses actually have been, you know, checked by other people. Uh, you know, the, the courts in particular have stepped in in a couple of key instances. Uh, that said, I think certain, the thing that worries me more is that, frankly, like, I feel exhausted. Um, you know, that just like every day, it's something new. There's always something, stories come and go really quickly. So I've given this talk about, um, I do these like public talks on like partisan polarization and partisan media. And like, it used to be the case that like, I would like do them once and then like I would update them like once a year and now I have to update them like every like two weeks because like no one remembers these examples. And I'm like, oh wait, what was that even about? And just because so much happened so quickly, I actually think in some ways that's the, the bigger danger is that like everything just turns over so quickly that then it becomes really hard to tell what's important and what's not. So just turning back to the issue of um, China and U.S. hegemony, I just wanted to know if China is unwilling um, to kind of assume this mantle of world leadership, first, to what extent is that a consequence, I guess, directly of the Trump administration, or how has he contributed to that mentality? And secondly, what are the consequences in terms of just more international splintering, fragmentation, essentially who's going to become the next hegemon, if anyone? So what I would say on this, uh, I think um, 
I don't think that China's role here is too much of a response to Trump. I mean, China has been growing for quite some time. Uh, some of the rhetoric is a response to Trump of saying, okay, we're willing to step into these roles, where you know previous Chinese administrations weren't willing to say that because they were too worried about seeming threatening by saying, by implying that China might have the capacity to do that. But now everybody recognizes that China is like a major player. Uh, that said, is it really, like, like China has, most, like most countries, kind of specific prosaic interests, is it really interested in managing things in the Middle East? No. Is it, like, there's a lot that comes with being this world leader that is unpleasant and costly that, you know, it's not really clear why the Chinese would want to do that. Uh, so one possibility here is uh, that you don't get, if the U.S. steps away from this, you, there doesn't have to be someone who steps into that role. Uh, uh, but if nobody does, then some of these things that you've had more, mac more management of, not always successfully, but, um, but you know, you've had the international community trying to handle this with somebody who has a, you know, is the first person who's going to step in, uh, there just won't be something like that. And then you're going to get more ad hoc uh, kinds of arrangements for dealing with stuff. There's more potential for miscalculations. You get something, you know, higher potential for things like what happened in Syria where the Russians say, okay, we're going to step in, the Americans are doing something else, and, you know, things can potentially spin out of control. Uh, fortunately, what happened over the weekend there doesn't look like it's spinning out of control, but that's the kind of thing that you have to worry about. Yeah, I, can I just, I, I just add, um, just, to, just to be clear, like the United States still has like massive interest in um, various corners of the world. So just focusing on, on Africa, we have more than 7,000 troops in different countries. We have AFRICOM uh, located, you know, in, in obviously in, in Africa, we have uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, we, we want to fight insurgencies of, you know, Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia. There's also uh, the amount of gas, natural gas and oil that is the discoveries uh, in the world are concentrated uh, predominantly in countries that, uh, that had low, low capacity, so weren't able to drill before. So we have in 2007 uh, a huge uh, uh, finding in Ghana in Uganda, in, in Kenya, in Tanzania. So the United States is not disappearing uh, so fast. I think that's important to, uh, to, 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 to make clear. The second thing I want to say that uh, the penetration of, of China and Russia predates, uh, 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 predates uh, uh, President Trump. And to some extent, President Obama, with his disengagement from countries that have abuse of, uh, of a, of a uh, um, you know, a legacy of, of, of human rights abuse and do not uphold uh, democracy. His, his disengagement from some of these countries and say, hey, we're not going to trade with you, we're not going to necessarily uh, provide you aid, is exactly why China was able to come in and say, hey, I don't care about like, your human rights violations. So, so you know, the, the, just to be also like, fair with the, like, the, uh, the, the, the sequencing of, uh, of events. I'll just make one last comment on this is that I think it's really hard to turn a big ship quickly and so I don't have an overwhelming I obviously heard from my comments I'm concerned about things happening at the WTO and concerned about trade negotiations but there's a lot of pushback in our institutions and Republicans are having meetings with the president regularly saying we don't want this to happen in the renegotiations of NAFTA we want it to still look at you know in in this particular way there's a lot of reasons that even though I think we should be concerned and engaged, there's also reasons not to, I think, overreact to that or, or jump to conclusions that the whole world is turning in, in the next, you know, three years. Um, what can be done to help low-income working women to vote more, especially with all the voter suppression? And I'm not sure how, ma how many voted in the election, but altogether, what was it, 50% voted in the presidential election? I mean, of the whole country, so. Right. Nobody takes Medicaid, Medicaid or food stamps seriously if women aren't a powerful voting bloc like senior citizens. Well, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I'm not a pollster, but I do know that actually women of color among all the groups of women are the most likely to turn out to vote. So I just think that, you know, obviously people have to become elected through voting, but that's not where most of the power lies in politics. It's interest groups, it's lobbies. You know, lobbies are tremendously important for getting money to key areas. Um, and so, you know, it's not only 
whether or not people exercise their votes, but also whether they have the money to form larger advocacy um, institutions. And so, you know, if we're going to think about what some of those policy agendas are, it's like, well, who are the, who are the lobbyist groups and who is funding them? And I will say that everybody should know here, you know, women do not donate to political campaigns in anywhere near the amount um, that men do. We tend to do smaller denominations. So female candidates and people who could push for these types of things, the majority of female candidates are in the Democratic Party, they have been for many years, um, get much smaller donations, even if they tend to raise the same amount of money. So there's a lot of different theories about why this is the case. One is that, well, women may not women are poorer on average than men, obviously, in this country. So they don't have as much money to give. Maybe they think it's a collaborative discussion with a partner back home. The other possibility is that, um, you know, because women aren't running giant businesses, they don't have the same quid pro quo understanding about financial donations. But I think, you know, donating to women candidates who are, you know, d dedicated to these causes, women in the Democratic Party or in the non-aligned, you know, non-conventional socialist um, parties, et cetera, is a good way, is a good way to think about that type of advocacy. So I don't think we can blame just the voters. Do you believe that future administrations are likely to continue the Trump administration's turn towards isolationism, or do you believe that the Trump administration is going to end up being viewed as a bit of a blip in the his 21st century history of presidential administrations? I mean, I, I, you, you may have just seen I shrugged my shoulders. I, I really don't know. I mean, I think, uh, well, isolationism and the administration is, is stronger than it has been in other administrations. There's always been a, a significant group in the U.S. and many countries who believe that, you know, take care of our internal priorities first. Um, how the balance of that shifts over time and what it results into who, who ends up getting office, I actually don't know, and I think that it'll be very interesting to see, but sorry, I, I at least can't offer insight on that. <laughs> I mean, what I would say would be to touch on some of uh, Professor Bucko's specific points. This is, is touching at long-term issues. Uh, the fact that the U.S. It has to put a fair amount of resources into international politics to do the kinds of things it wants. At the same time, when Trump talks about the things he wants to do in the world, they're not things that you can do as an isolationist. You can't go and destroy ISIS and be an isolationist. Um, and so in that sense, I, I'm a little leery of even calling him totally an isolationist, because uh, he is very activist in certain respects. He's not, he's kind of all over the place. Um, but I think you're going to continue to have a set of people who feel like, I mean, it, very long-term issues. I mean, if you talk about aid, for example, Americans have always said that the U.S. spends way too much on aid and also have always massively overestimated how much Americans actually spend on aid. And so you're going to continue to have those kinds of uh, things that you'll have people who uh, who push for cutting cutting down on engagement internationally. Um, I think you know I, I don't necessarily see any big changes up front, but there's always the possibility, and there's always things can change remarkably quickly sometimes. I, I would just say one, one thing on one, one thing on that issue very very briefly is to watch out through the resilience of the bureaucracy to the extent to which. Uh, if we're going to see massive exoduses from the, the bureaucracy of uh, Korea, civil servants, we're in a different world in which uh, Korea, civil servants uh, stay, stay put and, and wither the storm. Hi. I haven't heard anybody say anything about the administration's stance on science and environmental policies. And it seems that that can have far-reaching ramifications. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I'd say is it's not that different from uh, from like any other Republican administration. You know, I, like imagine the counterfactual world in which Donald Trump uh, never runs. He decides to, you know, do whatever it was he was doing before this, I guess, being a reality TV star. Um, you know, in, in say, imagine, you know, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio wins. I don't actually see them pushing policies that are, you know, all that different, maybe different on the margins, but not sort of different in substance. Um, you know, I think this gets back to an important point between the difference between admit what political scientists and legal scholars call agency rulemaking or executive orders 
the differences between them aren't hugely important for our purposes, and laws, so that almost everything Obama did, um, you know, all the stuff we talk about, like the clean, you know, clean power plant plan, all the methane rules, clean water rules, like all of those are done as, you know, so-called, they're the, under the so-called rulemaking power of all of those laws. They pass no new laws, they just use their existing authority under these laws to direct the EPA and other agencies to basically impose tougher new standards. And so I think there's there's sort of a lesson there, you know, that I think a lot of liberals kind of felt like, oh, this is great, like we've put all these systems in place, um, but they're very easily undone, you know. Um, you know, you can sue under the courts, and, and there are certain statutory requirements about how these things have to be done. Some of the things that have been overturned, it's been basically because they haven't done these correct things. Um, but I think it points to, in some sense, that the longer term solution, like the way the U.S. system is set up, is Congress is supposed to pass laws, right? And that the largest, most durable changes always have to come from, le from legislative solutions rather than these other types of vehicles. Matt, do you think the United States would have withdrawn from the Paris Climate uh, Agreement had it been Marco Rubio? I mean, that's uh, you know, harder in part because, as Alex pointed out, there's a certain degree of symbolism there. I think he would have faced a lot of pressure. Um, I think he would have faced a lot of, he may not in the end have done it. He would have faced tremendous pressure to do it. Right? And most importantly, it wouldn't really have changed American policy with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Because yeah. the U.S. really, they, they said it would be nice if we didn't increase the temperature by more than 2%. Two degrees, but yeah. Yeah, two, two degrees, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we didn't actually say we're going to do anything practical to prevent that from happening. So, um, hi. Um, in, even in recent months, uh, the Republican hostility to the FBI and DOJ has um, increased. Speaker Ryan has called for a quote-unquote cleansing of the FBI. Um, members of the House caucus have called for a purge of the FBI. Uh, how much danger is the FBI really in of being politicized, and what effect could that have on our politics going forward? Yeah, so this is um, part of what I talked about when I talked about, you know, kind of everything becoming political. Like, um, you know, if you could have told the me of, uh, you know, I don't know, 1993, that someday there will be a Republican administration uh, that, you know, really doesn't, isn't that hostile towards Russia and really hates the FBI. Like, I'd have thought you were from like this, I was just like, you're totally crazy. I would have encouraged you to seek mental health counseling. <laughs> I mean, because these are the kind of, I mean, if you go back, like the original origins of the FBI were to investigate, you know, kind of people with communist sympathies, like the, you know, the FBI is deeply involved with investigating people throughout the civil rights movement, through the anti-war movement, right? This was not like, this is not a kumbaya drum circle leftist kind of, you know, organization. Um, I mean, to me, the, the, the danger of this is, um, it's sort of like, you know, in a, a way, kind of the same thing that's happening in PA right now, right? So if you saw um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court made a decision about uh, gerrymandering, and then Republicans in the, the State House and the State Senate have basically said, well, if, you know, the uh, justices don't, uh, you know, do what we want, we're going to move to impeach them. You know, this is part of what I mean about, like, this... Um, the politicization of the process, I mean, I think in the, my, I think it would be hard for them to take a strong move against Republicans in the short term, but this is what I worry about in the, like, longer term is that if everything is now up for political debate, then that, you know, the, it just makes every, it just makes it a lot harder to agree on what the kind of boundary, the boundaries are, and so that's something that is more troubling. I mean, I'd like to think that there would still be, he'd still get a lot of pushback in Congress if he tried um, to do that, but, um, you know, I don't exactly know what would happen. Uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, recently, or I guess over the last year, between Trump and North Korea, and, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, macho macho talk back and forth and whose nuclear button's bigger and all of that. Um, do you all think that there's, you know, any chance of an imminent conflict in Korea? And how do you see those relations playing out over the next couple years? Um, so in general, North Korea, 
like my reading on what's going on with the North Korean regime is that they are, at the end of the day, reasonably level-headed people who understand that they have no real friends in the world. And so their ability to maintain the life that they have as rulers of a country are, is contingent on maintaining control over their society, which benefits from having an adversarial relationship with the rest of the world, and with not actually provoking that adversarial relationship so far that it turns into a war that gets them kicked out of power. Uh, and there have been a lot, you know, for how much the Kims have, you know, acted in really provocative and apparently destabilizing ways, they've never really crossed the line. Um, so from that perspective, I think there's a little bit more stability there than you might see at the, uh, you might intuit from kind of the, the degree of rhetoric and all of that and how different this looks from most other aspects of international politics. That said, when you're doing this, there are always risks. Um, that you can you can miscalculate. You do something, and uh, this designed to just kind of you know put the other side in its place, and it escalates into something much bigger than you thought it would. Um, and so you're always playing with fire there. Certainly, I think you've been playing with fire a little bit more in the last couple months than you had before. Um, it's not you know the. The U.S. has talked at various times about carrying out strikes against the North Koreans. They've always been deterred in the past by the amount of uh, punishment the North Koreans could inflict on South Korea and on others, and that's gone up over time. Um, it's not clear what really would be gained by doing that right now. So from that perspective, my baseline guess would be it's not nothing big is going to happen, but I'm not going to say for sure that that's the case. If you accept the premise Part of the genius of the American political system is its two-party nature, which requires essentially any party that comes to power to move to the middle, um, at least it has in the past. And with the rise of independence um, and the increasing tribalism of the two parties, um, do you perceive that we are moving away from that system? And do you perceive that there is likely to be a fracturing of one or both of the parties that will change the way we go about electing people? OK, I'm going to take this one. So I don't accept the premise that the genius of the American system is the winner takes all rules. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's plenty of problems in countries that have PR, but or other sort of systems, mixed systems. But I think, you know, it's a huge problem for our politics. Um, it's a huge problem. It also has these funny little institutional layers underneath them, like the direct primary and the Republican Party, which has the effect of often electing very extreme candidates, people who are the meeting of the Republican voters, um, to f contest for national office. And then you also have, of course, like the caucus system and whether and you know who actually gets to elect the, um, or who actually gets to choose the nominee. But I would say, you know, when I ask my students um, in their first or second year in political science classes, uh, you know, what is the majoritarian system and what is PR? I feel like we are uh, incredibly ignorant about what that what the differences are. And the idea that the person who gets the most votes or the party who gets the most votes isn't always the winner is obviously a huge problem in um, in the United States. And so the whole system, the whole way of gerrymandering, all of this stuff is reducing representation. And I would say for min minority representation and also for women's representation, countries that use PR systems um, are much more diverse because it's much less about the individual candidate's ability to cultivate their own personal constituency and much more about the role of the parties in promoting the careers of, um, of politicians from different backgrounds. So. Ah, proportional representation. So in proportional representation, there's like a lot of different ways you can do it. Israel has a single constituency. Like all people vote for uh, any candidate whatsoever. So it's like a single one. It's a, it's a single yeah. list. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's list a, you vote for parties. You vote for parties, exactly. And so there's different ways to do it. You can either vote for a party, and anybody the party puts on their list gets elected. Or there are some lists where You've, you can vote for individual candidates within a party. But it's much more that the, the well, there, there can be un, inconsistencies, but the people who get the most votes, the party who gets the most votes, tend to seat the most 
candidates overall. And so you get a lot more diversity and many more parties. So you actually can express your preferences in different ways. And this leads to coalition governments where sometimes you have far left and far right forming a coalition. And it's just a different way of doing business. Also, the government can often dissolve if it, if it uh, you know, goes completely out of favor. So you know, the system here is incredibly rigid, and it makes it very difficult um, to legislate. It also makes it very difficult to break down some of the you know, old networks of power because it's impossible to um, to get in to the parties. But the one thing that I would oh, sorry, uh, the one thing I would say with respect to party fracturing, uh, in part because of like the primaries and everything in the U.S., like the parties. You're, you're much better off just taking over one of the parties the way like the Tea Party has tried to do than to, to break it. People who try to build th third parties, that doesn't work very well. Instead, you'll see the parties move, but I would expect, I wouldn't see a high probability that you'd see serious third parties uh, replacing the two that are there. Yeah. I, I would say that one thing that I do agree with your comment is that we all need to be worried about polarization. That's not in our interest. I mean, when parties feel that the way to win election is to uh, appeal to the center, we get more moderate, politi mo more moderate uh, policies. When parties feel that the only game in town is getting out their base in order to win election, uh, and there's, without any need to, uh, to reach across uh, the aisle, you get uh, Red American policies that cater to the base. The base tends to be uh, more, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, the right base tends to be more right than, than the average American, and the, the, the left base tends to be much more left than the average American. So you get, uh, you, it, it, it feeds itself, and, and it, 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 also means, it also means that if you're in a world in which uh, uh, we're in a hyper-polarized uh, uh, world, uh, very few people are willing to also vote to the better candidate if it's from the other party. Um, and so, because the perceived distance and the, the, the fear that the other party will be in power and will implement these policies that cater to the base is just too high because you're so, we've got so much to lose. So a world in which we are, uh, if you look at countries that went through uh, erosion of democracy uh, in recent years, and United States, we, we, we talk about the United States, but this is obviously, we, we're in an era where this is happening, you know, in many countries, it's happening in Austria, in Hungary, in Poland, in, in Turkey. Uh, these are usually uh, episodes that come after a hyper-polarized uh, 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 kind of a period. I think we were going to do one more question. Um, I just wanted to, to push back on this conversation about whether or not the administration is abdicating uh, retrenchment or not. Um, I think it's definitely fair to say that a lot of the statements made by the executive don't have a large impact on United States policy and engagement with the world, but I think a lot of the um, the actual actions made by the executive and policies implemented in our our institutions have had very real impact on our engagement with the world. So, um, you know, proposed budgets that reduce funding for some of our largest diplomatic initiatives, like the Fulbright program, um, requiring like smaller delegations at the UN General Assembly that limits our ability to have bilateral meetings with states, um, appointing leadership to the State Department that has uh, canceled foreign service exams and has issued a hiring freeze on new members of our, our diplomatic corps. I think that those are all steps that do have real implications for our ability to engage internationally going forward. So I know that wasn't really a question, but maybe if you could comment on that. What I would say is I absolutely agree with that. If we think about you know getting back to some of the questions about how the um, how the like, like the future of the American liberal order, it's not that the U.S. is explicitly abdicating the kinds of policies and outcomes that you want with that. I mean, sometimes you're not talking about promoting democracy as much as you did in the past or you know, upholding human rights. Uh, but some of this is undermining the ability to do that. And that's, I think, what, what you're talking about here. That's not something that I expect to have an immediate impact. But uh, if you know, Trump, you know, if the next president who comes along discovers like the State Department is now incapable of doing the things that are necessary to uphold this, then that's that's going to limit what you can do, even if you want to continue with the policy. So thank you to our panel. And thank you to all of you for coming to Penn Arts and Sciences Knowledge by the Slice.